Let's, uh, let's pray together. Our God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather and for the opportunity to open up your word. Uh, we do want to be a people of your word. So Holy Spirit, bless us, guide us, and protect us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Right, we are in Jeremiah 2, and my, my intention is to have, or to cover at least one chapter a Sunday. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to do that, but that's my intention, which will take us all the way through the, the uh, school year. So we are in Jeremiah 2, it says, verse 1, Actually, verse 1 and 2, verse 1 and 2. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord. I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, when you went after me in the wilderness, in the land not sown. It's curious to me, this is a side note, uh, how these prophets knew that this word was coming from God, and I have to guess that they simply didn't have any doubt, that, that they were absolutely confident that this was God's word. Um, whatever God did to give them that confidence, um, they had it, and, uh, and Jeremiah has it here. He says, go cry, uh, in the hearing of Jerusalem, reminds us that the core of Jeremiah's work as a prophet were messages to Judah and Jerusalem, which Jerusalem was the capital of, of Judah. Why are Judah and Jerusalem all of Israel in Jeremiah? To speak to Judah, to speak to Jerusalem, was to speak to all of Israel. Why is that? Yeah, historically, right. historically, the northern tribes have been wiped out. 722, they speculate, uh, wiped out by Assyria. And uh, back in those days, uh, when, when the break occurred uh, under um, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, um, there were some, according to Chronicles, there were some priests who went ahead and went south because they didn't want to be under Jeroboam. So there were some faithful priests who went south and became a part of Judah, even though they were from the northern tribes. Um, I remember Peter Lightheart um, talking about the uh, separation of uh, northern tribes versus southern tribes to be very akin to the separation of Western churches, Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodox, to, um, to Evangelicalism, um, Protestant churches. Um, same type of sins, uh, similar to uh, such splitting up. He, he says, I remember you, the kindness of your youth. Um, through Jeremiah, God made a heartfelt appeal to Jerusalem, drawing upon the memory of their past relationship. Is there something that you can think of in the New Testament that's similar Drawing upon past relationship? The prophets remembering how the time that he brought them into uh, the promised land, how akin they were to him as compared to now. You think of God lamenting about that in the New Testament? Sounds like a good Jeopardy question, huh? It does. Revelation 2, 1. To the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things says the Lord, He who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your work, your labor, your patience, and you cannot bear those who are evil. You have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. You have preserved and have patience and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Mm -hmm. So he's remembering the relationship he had with them, and, and, and that relationship had changed. Revelation 3.14 is another example of that. 
3.14. And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things says the Lord, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation. I know your works, that you are neither cold or hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And it goes on to talk about how their relationship has changed. So um, I, I have had um, parishioners in the past say to me with, with a heartfelt um, concern, how do the people in the Old Testament, how do they just walk away from the Lord? <laughs> and and I, I do look befuddled at them because I go, well, many Christians do exactly the same thing today. It's, it's, it's not any different than, than it was. Look at the denominations that have such great foundations and have literally walked away from the Lord. Um, yeah, we, we do it because we're, we're sinful by nature. Um, he says, when you were uh, in, met me in the wilderness, again, this is uh, referring to uh, the Exodus uh, and then uh, in the Holy Land. Israel was holiness to the Lord. Uh, this is what God commanded Israel to be in the wilderness. And in some measure, Israel fulfilled it, at least for a time. They were separated for God and they needed to depend on God. It's when they stopped depending on God that uh, all things uh, went awry. So that, I, I didn't read that, verse 3. Israel was holiness to the Lord, the fruit, first fruits of his increase, and all that devour him will offend. Disaster will come upon them, says the Lord. That is all who offend um, God and his people. Um, devour him, the, the offenders, in this season of special relationship with God, the Lord took special care of Israel. Anyone who attempted to devour Israel, disaster came upon them. And we see that, of course, occurring in the promised land. Verses 4 through 8. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What injustice have your fathers found in me, that they have gone far from me? have followed idols and have become idolaters. Neither did they say, where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through the, a land of deserts and pits, through a land of drought and the shadow of death, through the land that no one crossed and where no one dwelt. I brought you into a bountiful country to eat its fruit and its goodness. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priest did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Okay, uh, so the great ingratitude of rebellious Israel. Uh, Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house. Thus saith the Lord, what injustice have your fathers found in me? So God called the house of Israel to account for their rejection of him in their pursuit of idols. He asked to know what fault there was in him that caused their idolatry. Does that remind anybody of a study, of a study we've done recently? This calling out, this challenge? Examine me. Job, Job right? It's exactly the rebuke he gave of Job. Okay, you go ahead, Joe. You start to correct me and, and see where we're missing, uh, where we're crossing paths. Uh, so this calling out is, is, um, is quite important and, and consistent with, with God's way of rebuking. They followed idols and have become idolaters. Uh, this whole idea of following is actually pursuing. You could translate that word pursuing. Uh, this is a great saying to remember. When you, when you follow after worthlessness yourself, you yourself become worthless. When you follow after worthlessness, you yourself become worthless. Mm -hmm. um, there's also in this description of, of how they're following after these things, um, what, what's, what's been called syncretism. 
You've heard that before, where you try to combine your faith with all the other silliness that's going on around you and try to make it look like the world, but yet feel good about how you're still worshiping God. Um, how, do, how does modern worship not fit the same description? Is not modern worship trying to be like the world, but yet still be Christian? I don't know how else to describe it. Um, you guys ever been to, um, oh, what's the name of it? I forget the name of the store. <laughs> ah, um, shoot. You ever been to a, like, like a, a, a knockoff store or the stores that collect um, Gabe's. Gabe or Brothers. Well, they call, it, they call it Gabe's now. You ever been to Gabe's? Okay. Gabe's has a section. They, they, they get all the clothes and stuff that other stores are rejecting or it's gone out of, um, you know, over expired and so on. Um, you go to Gabe's and you can get knockoff cologne. Like, this cologne is like, you know, more expensive cologne. And I read an article years ago that described Christian rock as knockoff cologne. <laughs> um, trying to be like the world, but yet you know, you're, you're not quite up to snuff, uh, even in the, in the talent perspective. And that's, that's my uh, concern about uh, this type of worship, the syncretism. Um, the Lord says he brought them to a bountiful country to eat of its fruit and its goodness. That was his gift. To them, um, the events of, of the Exodus happened some 800 years before Jeremiah's time. That's a long time. It's understandable, though not good, that Israel would come to take the blessings of the land for granted after 800 years. There is less explanation as to why we take the good works of God for granted, sometimes only weeks later. Any guesses why we take the Good works of God for granted. No? Yeah? Well, my assumption is that it happens so often that we come to expect it. Yeah, or you get used to them, right? Okay. That's what I was thinking as well. So we, st we, we forget its source? Or, or, yeah. or? And then that there's a lack of teaching, a lack of modeling by pastors, by Mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. and, 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 and those teachers and preachers start to focus on other things besides the good works of God. Another gift that we should be very thankful for is the church calendar because it allows, if you're staying within scripture, it allows you to rehearse those good gifts of God over and over again um, and hopefully never tiring of recognizing just how good God has been to us. He says, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. Um, God called the land of Israel his, and he called Israel itself his. Um, and both of these uh, defiled him and were an abomination because of their idolatry. But how, how is, how is idolatry an abomination? It's quite a dramatic, dramatic word, isn't it? Abomination. How is idolatry an abomination? Well, you're taking the created thing and turning it into a god, um, which is the exact opposite of what God wants you to do. Okay. So it's, 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 uh, I, the word I came up with is it's an affront to God. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's, it's so opposite of his very nature when you think of the God who created all things versus the creation itself. Um, it's so polar opposite of him that to actually worship it like you would worship Almighty God, how offensive that must be to him to, 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 to see it that way. And, that, and that, it reminds me of how silly we are as, as parents when our children are not grateful. Right? And we just kind of get really peeved at them for not being grateful. And, and yet, this is Almighty God. This is us who were created by him. And, and how an affront that must be to him to, for us to turn to something 
uh, and worship it besides him. So he also recognizes that the priests are responsible. They did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handled the law did not search out the law to find God. The religious leaders of Israel did not serve God or the people. They did not seek the Lord. They did not ask, where is the Lord? Um, that is the constant reminder that when, when, he, when we seek him, he promises we will find him. And when we don't seek him, we will find everything else to worship. It's simply that way. Uh, those who handle the law refers to the priests and the Levites who were to teach, exposit, interpret, and this is important, apply the law of God to the lives of the people. Remember, they were to, they were to be the wrestlers with the people when they were having disagreements and disputes. It was the priests, it was the Levites who were to go, okay, this is how the word of God applies to your dispute. This is how, they were the judges. It, 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 uh, they, they were the intermediary people that, that were to apply the word of God to the lives of the people. And I believe um, that's important to today. Ministers should be helping people apply the word of God to their lives. One of the problems is, and this is my critique to you, one of the problems is you don't ask. You don't say, I got a dilemma. How do I apply the word of God to this, Pastor? If you don't ask that, I can't answer that. We just kind of go through our lives figuring things out for ourselves. But Proverbs tells us that there is wisdom in what? Counsel of many. A multitude of counselors. Yeah. But we don't take advantage of that, which we should. Uh, that's why God has put them there. The rulers also transgressed um, prophesying by Baal. Um, civic and religious leaders did more harm than good for the people and not by not turning to the Lord, but actually turning to a false idol. Who or what was Baal? Um, I, I, I summed it up in this way. Baal was a fertility god, uh, even king of the gods similar to Zeus who was you know king of the Greek gods this is the king of the of the ancient Near East gods um, he insisted on sexual ritual in worship and the sacrifice of animals and in particular this is interesting pigs which is you you, you look at why why was God against bacon <laughs> have to ask it that way because bacon is probably one of the best meats you could ever eat <laughs> why is God against bacon and, and one of the reasons is, and this is one, in many of the laws that you see uh, in, in uh, Leviticus uh, are, are laws that are against what other nations are doing in their cult worship. God wasn't just calling away from pigs because he didn't like bacon. He was calling away from pigs because that's what the other, the false idols were being worshipped by, or how the false idols were being worshipped. So He's, he's focusing on something to say, come away from those nations. Be different than those nations. Um, I've mentioned this before, the, the main principle of why, why Isaac was, was what the Lord called Abraham to sacrifice Isaac was to show Abraham that he's not like these other gods. He doesn't require uh, human sacrifice. Uh, that, that's not what God is requiring. Of, uh, I'm, not, I'm not like the other gods is the lesson there. And here he's, uh, because... We have Baal wanting pigs. God says, I don't want pigs. Uh, and, and some did offer their children. And that's when you read those stories about how they went about offering children. It's, it's horrendous. Um, and of course, um, we rightly need to recognize that the uh, offering of children there is very similar to our offering of, of children in abortion to today. We offer it up because we worship other things. We worship our sexual lifestyle, we worship our selfish lifestyles um, instead of uh, sacrificing our lives. Now, verses 9 through 12. 9 through 12. Therefore I will yet bring charges against you, says the Lord, and against your children's children. I will bring charges for past beyond the coast of Cyprus. See, send Kedar uh, and consider diligently and see if there has been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods? But my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. 
Be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, says the Lord. So here's the astonishing nature of Israel's sin. Since Israel liked to look to the surrounding nations in imitation of their idolatry, God asked his rebellious people to look to an event distance places beyond the coasts of Cyprus and Kedar and to ask, do they forsake their gods? Strangely, the heathen around Israel were more faithful to their pagan gods than Israel was to the living God. Think of that contrast. They never leave their pagan gods. They stay faithful to them. But the true God that Israel was, had revealed to them, they so easily leave for other gods. Why do you think that is? Why what? I mean, why, 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 why do they stay faithful and yet the real faith people abandon? Yep. It's tradition. Like your family's done it. It's easier to be traditional in that area. Okay. Tradition kind of throws me, but okay. Um, yeah, Matt. I was just thinking it's like I was talking about the, the narrow path and the wide path. Mm -hmm. He said the, the faith, the uh, Christian faith, which is similar but can be very difficult. It's a, not many people are going to go down that path right. and be able to do it. And a lot of the yeah, think about how conscientious you have to be to be faithful in your Christian walk. In everything you do, by what you watch, by what you say, by what you think, let alone your outward behavior. There's an inward battle going on all the time. You're going against what naturally you want to do. Whereas this, the, the, the pagan stuff, you just have to do it outwardly. You, 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 you know, do, do your ritual, get your God appeased, and go on your way and do whatever the hell you want, um, literally. So yeah, it's uh, much more appealing to the flesh uh, than, than otherwise. Um, Cyprus was the western point in Judah's geography. Um, Kedar was a desert tribe in the east, so the appeal is west to east, to look both west to east. Um, but my people have ch changed their glory for what does not profit. The heathen nations were faithful to their gods even though their gods did nothing for them. That's another interesting. They did something for their conscience but nothing uh, tangible in terms of victory uh, or, or overcoming the enemy. Um, be astonished, be, be afraid, desolate, Astonishment that men can be so foolish, disloyal, and ungrateful. Then it is something to fear because a righteous God must answer such outrageous rebellion. And finally, it is a desolation because the result of judgment upon the rebellious people will leave little behind. My question is, this, this focus is on fearing God because of his judgment and the lack of uh, reward for the false gods. Is fear the best of motivating factors? The best? What kind of fear? Fear of judgment, fear of um, right. eternal damnation, fear of God. Like the reverential fear that we talked about with the Lord, right? Well, to me, the prophet is using fear, fear of God's judgment hand in order for them to turn away from their idols, um, we could use fear to call people to repentance, but normally we choose to talk about God's love, at least many churches do. So what should it be? Should we focus on fear to get people to turn away or love? Yeah. I think that's the biggest difference. Yeah. But it's an important initial step, yeah. isn't it? Mm -hmm. 
Because when you think of how dramatic it is that they're worshiping false gods in place of the true God that's been revealed to them, they need to turn away immediately. And fear is the way to get someone to do something immediately. Then you can fill it with love. Then you can fill it with devotion and all the things that, that, that Paul spends a great deal of time focusing on, especially Ephesians, folks. Ephesians really focuses on that devotional love that we're to have for God. But fear gets the person to turn around. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, but it makes it interesting, isn't it? There are churches that try to preach hell and damnation every Sunday. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yes, at least they preach it. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. So this was the first of the evils of God's people to forsake God. This is evil not only for its disloyalty and ingratitude, but also because it's so foolish. God is the fountain of living water. Jesus used the same uh, descriptive. The never ending supply of good, pure, essential water. In the ancient Near East, a fountain of living water an artesian spring was something special. It was a constant supply of good, fresh, living water that came to you. You don't, I trust you realize how important water is to Israelites because it's a desert on top. But it's not a, de it's not a desert because there's abundant water underneath. So they had to dig wells constantly to get that water to come up. And when they found one and dug one, and receive that water, that, that place, that, that, that the place became so very important for them. So they're exchanging what is good and fresh and living, they're exchanging it for dead water. You know, as soon as you pull out water from its source, it starts that process. And the breakdown of all the things that are in that water uh, start to die. And so that water becomes less and less fresh or healthy uh, the, the more it sits in a container. Um, and so not only are they choosing a less fresh water, but they're choosing it in cisterns that don't hold the water. And so the water leaks out. Um, Israel, in fact, uh, is filled with cisterns. Both, and cisterns are two different types of cisterns. One is the type of cistern that you, it's small, it's a pottery type thing or they have large cisterns that they would build and they would be far underground and they would store their water in these larger cisterns that they would use for primarily for bathing and not for drinking their drinking water was usually coming up from the well uh, that was one of the fascinating things about going to israel was they have these these cisterns dug out where you can go down the steps and you can see how large the the, the um, holding place was for uh, their bathing water all right, verses 14 through 19. Is Israel a servant? Is he a homeborn slave? Why is he plundered? The young lions roared at him and growled. They made his land waste. His cities are burned without inhabitant. Also the people of Nov and of Tapanes have broken the crown of, of your head. Have you not brought this on yourself? Is that you? is in that you have forsaken the Lord your God when he led you in the way. And now why take the road to Egypt to drink the waters of Sahur? Or why take the road to Assyria to drink the waters of the river? Your own wickedness will correct you and your backslidings will rebuke you. Know therefore and see that it is an evil and bitter thing that you have forsaken the Lord your God and the fear of me is not in you, says the Lord God. Of hosts. So God's people look to Egypt and Assyria to forsake the Lord. Um, the cities of Nof and Tapanes are Egyptian cities. Another name for them is Memphis, the ancient capital of Lower Egypt, near modern Cairo. <clears throat> God warned Judah not to trust in Egypt 
which would or perhaps had by that time have broken the crown of your head by defeating and killing the good King Josiah in battle. Remember, that's the same time as that Jeremiah began this work under Josiah. Um, the reason was plain. Israel uh, was captive uh, by Egypt and were slaves under Egypt. To look to Egypt now is a great irony and, and to go back to what God had delivered them from. Um, the waters of their rivers of, of Assyria were compared to the fountains of living water found in the Lord. No matter how appealing the prospect of alliance with Egypt might be, Judah would suffer for it became entangled with all of the practices of Egypt. So Hor means blackness and is a, a sarcastic reference to the river of Nile, uh, one of the most highly venerated of the Egyptian gods. Your own wickedness will correct you. If Jerusalem did not continue on their destructive course, there would be more than enough correction and rebuke found in the consequences of their actions. Their, their consequences of their actions could, could be very well be worse than God's judgment upon them. What does the fear of the Lord look like in the Christian life? How does the fear of the Lord affect you? Someone says to you, do you fear God? You say, yes. How does that affect your life? What does fearing God mean in your everyday life? Okay, yeah, motivation to avoid sin, choose the right rather than the wrong. What else? Reference to, well, I guess it's kind of related, but reference to behave properly. I mean, not only in church, I guess, but just in everyday life. <laughs> right, not only in church, right. <laughs> yeah, not only on Sundays, but every day. Yeah, yeah, reverence. Um, behavior. Sense that your your relationship with God is something completely different than all the other relationships that you have in your life in the sense that I approach God differently because he is the one that protects me from wickedness. He protects mm -hmm. me from all those things. And he can also turn me to those things, turn me to myself, and I'm so easily, you know, it's a it's it's completely different than anything else that mm -hmm. I have in my life. So mm -hmm. I, I, I fear him because of that relationship that I have with him as well. I wonder, you're reminding me how at times we can, in some ways, fear to lose our spouse, fear yeah. to lose that love in our life. Yeah. And that can be motivating to fear losing God not having his everlasting love known to us and our confidence in him. Yeah. 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 I think about it as like three stages in regards to learning and obedience. But when, I'm, when I was living underneath my parents' rules, you, you fear God, you, you be taught that, okay, I gotta do what my parents say because I'm mm -hmm. fearful of that. And then also, as a parent now, I'm fearing God in regards to what mm -hmm. he looks through me and okay, how my child's behaving. That's a, also a different yeah. What, one, one thing that stood out to me when I asked that question is fearing God for me means I need to live a life of repentance. Mm -hmm. I need to continue to ask God to, for forgiveness. Specifically, not just generally. Yeah. Specifically, for sins known. Um, and I, I've thought about that when I, when I go to visit folks, especially those who are sick um, and are you're a little bit older, but even younger. Um, I need to counsel people more to seek God in repentance. That that one of the things that it's, it's good about um, uh, last rites or you know going to visit someone who's near death is to focus on asking God for forgiveness. Make sure your sins are confessed. Um, that's extremely uh, important. Um, and so living that life of repentance, always seeking God to, to forgive us our sins, um, 
even, even I, I shared a couple weeks ago um, that I, the Lord has really helped me not fear death through this pandemic. But when I went flying, um, I think it was going out to Kansas City, I had this weird anxiety. And I hadn't felt that in a while. And I, and I, I just confessed my sins. And the anxiety pretty much went away um, after that confession. Just living a life of repentance, trusting in God's mercies, uh, should be the, the Christian way. Yeah. That, that becomes difficult uh, in the first example you were talking about when you are trying to help somebody else sometimes. Because you almost, you can become, there's a fine line, you can become like Job's friends. And there's a reason why you're having this problem. You, you know, oh, oh, so yeah. you got to be careful with that to not. Yeah, I appreciate that. that. Yeah, that's. I'm sorry, that's not what I meant. No, I know you do. Yeah. I'm saying that can come in that, depending on the, what the right. situation is and stuff. Right. Yeah, my thinking was actually, I don't know what's going to happen in your life mm -hmm. from now until then. Yeah. So let's make sure that our conscience are clear before God. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, verse 20 through 25. For of old I have broken your yoke and burst your, your bonds, and you said, I will not transgress, when on every high hill and under every green tree lay down playing the harlot. Yet I have planted you a noble vine, a seed of highest quality. How then have you turned before me into the, de de the degenerate plant on an alien vine? For though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, your iniquity is marked before me, says the Lord. How can you say, I am not polluted? I have not gone after the Baals. See your way in the valley. You know that you have what you have done. You are swift, you are a swift dromedary, breaking loose in her ways, a wild donkey used to the wilderness that sniffs at the wind in her desire, in her time of mating who can turn her away. All those who seek her will not weary themselves in her month. They will find her. Withhold your foot from being unshod and your throat from thirst. But you said there is no hope. No, for I have loved aliens and after them I will go. Wow. I, pictures preaching this in a um, modern church service um, yeah, pretty much lose the congregation right away. Um, so they, they have unrestrained pursuits. God symbolically spoke of idolatry of the conquered northern kingdoms as prostitution. In going after idols, Israel was like a wife so unfaithful to her husband, she was a harlot consorting with idols. Why is playing the harlot, an appropriate allegory for sinning against God. There's a couple reasons. Being a harlot focuses on sex, right? Well, these are sex cults that they were following. So there's a direct connection between the sexuality. But it's also the intimacy that God feels he has with his people. He feels as though they are his bride, his, his beloved. And for them to turn away from him, like this for something else to be intimate with, to him, that's why it was such an affront. He had given so much as a spouse and yet they had turned away from him so readily it felt it was as if they were going after a heart, a, a, an adulterous situation. Um, from one commentator, he said, the many references to abnormal sexual gratification underline the most prominent features of the Canaanite religion, where male and female cult prostitutes were connected with their sanctuaries. So God uses three strong images here to describe the sin and the shame of Israel. They were like a prostitute, they were like a weed, and someone so dirty that no lye or soap 
to make them clean. Um, God had planted his people, and that makes them the whole idea of why he treats them like a weed. He had planted the people in thoroughly reliable um, soil for them to grow on, and yet they choose to grow up like a weed. Um, and of course, their whole idea of them being uh, filthy uh, is the corruption that was brought upon by the stain of their sin. That, that, that sin remains. It doesn't just, it quickly wash off. It remains unless God atones for it. It, it, it identifies with them. It becomes part of what they look like, who they are. Um, he says, see your, uh, your way in the valley. Know what you have done. Uh, this refers to the valley of Hinnom, uh, the deep gorge that lies to the west and south of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. Um, here all sorts of evil rites were practiced with even the worship of Baal and the worship of Molech. And Molech is that one god that would demand a child sacrifice. Uh, See your way in the valley, know what you have done. How could they claim innocence when they were carrying on their vile worship, even their child sacrifice? A wild donkey and a camel is what they're referring to, a swift dromedary, um, a, a wild donkey in heat, um, not able to control her desires, mounting on anything. Quite an image that they're giving, isn't it? This is quite a dramatic image that they're providing for us. Uh, young female camels are altogether unreliable, ungainly, and early, easily disturbed. Um, they dash about in apparently disorganized fashion. Uh, when, when in heat, the female donkey goes after the male with abandon. The female ass in heat is almost violent. She sniffs the path in front of her, trying to pick up the scent of the male in his urine. Then she races down the road in search for the male. The barefoot, the constant thirst, were marks of an exile and slave. This was the fate of a northern kingdom of Israel and the faith of Judah would follow. All right, 26 through 28. I'm trying to make it through here. Um, how much farther do we have to go? 27. Oh, you're a long ways, golly. <laughs> <laughs> As the thief is ashamed when he is found out, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They and their kings and their princes and their priests and their prophets, saying to a tree, you are my father, and to a stone you, you gave birth to me, when they have turned their back to me and not their face, but in the time of their trouble, they will say, Arise and save us. But where are your gods that you have made for yourselves? Let them arise, if they can, save you in the time of your trouble. For according to the number of your cities are your gods, O Judah. Wow, this is such a rebuke. Um, the thief is only ashamed when he is found out. He regrets getting caught. Yeah, think about that, folks, in terms of your own heart. When, you're, when your sin is found out, are you upset it was found out, or are you upset that you actually sinned against God? And of course, it's the latter part that we should be having in our hearts. The, the first part, uh, we should be thankful that it was found out. Saying to the tree, you are my father, uh, Jeremiah is talking about foolishness. Um, the stone represented by all the leading male Canaanite deity, these stone pillars have been found in excavations in Palestine. All that remains of the wooden poles is a post hole in which the rotted timber had been left uh, and colored the soil. There is enough archeological evidence for these to indicate the widespread usage of both stone and poles for Canaanite worship. At each Canaanite shrine, there was an Asherah pole, probably a wooden pillar with the, form, the formal substitute of a sacred tree representing female sexual element, and a mazaba or stone pillar, indicating the male element. There's a strong satire here, for it is the female symbol tree that is called father, and the male symbol stone that is called mother. You gave me birth. Israel was confused about what she was worshiping when she ascribed to the gods of fertility <clears throat> her very existence. Um, this mixing up of male and female, does that sound familiar at all? Sure anything we're experiencing uh, today. Okay, I'm going to stop there, and uh, I guess we'll have to finish uh, chapter 2 next week. Um, this was one of the longer rebukes of uh, Jeremiah, and, and quite aggressive. So.
So be thankful for your preacher who doesn't preach like that. Thanks all.